Okay, thank you, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, so, uh, so this will be based on papers with uh, John Stewart, Alan Rendal, and Jacques Boulevici, who was talking yesterday. Uh, and so the general topic is about uh, uh, the Cauchy problem for the Einstein equations under certain symmetry assumptions. And the basic assumption is that I will be assuming that there are two killing fields. Uh, and for some of the results, these killing fields will be restricted by some additional conditions. And what uh, I would like to do is to discuss some certain global geometric issues. Uh, so the first questions you can ask is uh, the existence of global foliations for these uh, space time. So you set up, we have seen that in a couple of lectures already, you set up the initial value problem, you put some initial data set, and you, you solve. Uh, and there are all kinds of issues about uh, choosing coordinates and constructing foliations. Uh, and the global property of the foliations are the first uh, question you, you, you want to ask. And if, uh, if you are able to, to define a piece of space-time, then you look at the future boundary of this uh, piece of space-time. And you, you want also to say some qualitative properties about uh, this boundary. Uh, so there are, there are results about uh, late-time asymptotics we have seen in the lecture of uh, uh, Jacques Boulevici yesterday, leading to geodesic completeness in, in some uh, uh, cases. And if you, if you continue down this, uh, this list, you can also ask about a uh, more precise property of, uh, of the boundaries and uh, sometimes establish censorship conjectures. But this, these statements are, are more uh, uh, difficult than proving the previous, uh, discussing the previous issues because this will be a generic statement on the initial data set. Right? So you don't prove something for general uh, uh, data, but only for generic uh, uh, data, which makes uh, proofs uh, more uh, complicated. OK, so this is a general topic I'm talking about uh, today. But uh, what is uh, new here is to be able to discuss space times which are not smooth. So most of the results uh, on, on these topics were, were done uh, assuming uh, sufficient regularity on the space times to be like C2 or C3 for some of the estimates. So if you only look for space times that, uh, for which you can define the curvature only in the distribution uh, sense, uh, you have to revisit many of, uh, of the techniques uh, that are supposed to be well established. And this is something I'm interested in both for vacuum space times uh, and uh, so again, where you have to look at the existing results and, and see how you can lower the regularity of the metric, but also look at the case, the case where you do the coupling between uh, uh, the Einstein equations and the Euler equations for compressible fluids. So in this situation, the fluids will uh, create shocks, and the shocks will have some uh, uh, influence on, uh, on the curvature of the spacetime. So in the second case, we are actually establishing new results that we could not establish without looking at this larger class of weakly regular space times. Now, the advantage of uh, looking at, uh, at the space time with symmetries uh, is, is that you have a, a much simpler uh, system of PDs to work with. So we typically obtain one plus one systems of coupled uh, nonlinear wave equations. And, but still, the structure is not uh, far from uh, being trivial. And you, you need to uh, work with the structure of the Einstein equations. And, and this is a good way to, 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 you know, to learn about uh, null structure and, and so on. And uh, many global ca causal issues uh, can be resolved in this situation, um, which may not be the case, uh, you know, not yet, at least uh, for general 3 plus 1 uh, space time. Uh, but we have seen with uh, the lecture of, uh, of Michalis a uh, lot of uh, uh, progress in the, in the direction of uh, analyzing uh, global properties of, uh, of space times without symmetries. Uh, so I want, again, to say that looking at weakly regular space time give you uh, the possibility to construct new classes of space times that you would not uh, have, have seen otherwise. And for instance, uh, we can construct uh, uh, generalizations of the so-called uh, colliding spacetimes of uh, Kahn and Penrose. 
which contains interacting uh, gravitational waves. And uh, so I want also to emphasize that doing this analysis for just in a one plus one situation suggests uh, certain generalizations that you, you would not have uh, even tried to, you know, to look for uh, without symmetry. Uh, and and in, in some sense, this, is, this gives you a feasibility uh, uh, proof that uh, such uh, space-time with low regularity, with weak regularity, might exist even in higher dimensions. And, and furthermore, it's really complementary to uh, other results that, again, we have seen in a, in a lecture of Michalis, uh, where you get rid of, uh, you, you don't assume the symmetry, uh, so with the symmetry or without the symmetry, you, you get results that uh, are not uh, uh, directly comparable. So when I started this uh, project, I, I was very much motivated by the work of Dimitri Christodoulou, uh, who studied and constructed spherically symmetric spacetimes with very low regularity, only BV, bounded variation regularity. And he was interested in, uh, in the situation where the matter is described by a scalar field, uh, or even he had a, a paper on two-phase, a two-phase T fluid. So it's not, uh, it's not a compressible case that I'm interested in, but, but still it, it goes into the, the situation of understanding uh, weak regularity at the BV level. And, and this is something he did because he wanted, I mean, he was able to settle positively the weak cosmic censorship uh, for, uh, for this class of space times. And, uh, and it was really important to, to go at this uh, level of regularity in order to establish this uh, cosmic censorship uh, uh, conjecture. So what I'm discussing uh, today uh, are works uh, in collaboration with John Stewart and especially there is a, a paper uh, we published a few years ago on, uh, on the construction of impulsive uh, plane symmetric spacetimes. Uh, then I look, so this is really without matter. I mean, it's a coupling with a scalar field, uh, essentially. Uh, and then I, I, I was working also for uh, some time with Alan Rendal. Uh, and, and this work is, uh, contains this uh, coupling. So it was the first work we, where we were able to do the coupling between the Einstein equations and the Euler equations. And more recently with Jacques Molivici, we started a, a series of papers on uh, vacuum T2 symmetric spacetimes. And, and the previous work here with Alan Rendal was matter with Gaudi symmetry. So slightly more symmetric than T2 symmetry. I want also to refer to the lecture of Michalis da Fermos yesterday. Uh, he talked about uh, uh, a breakthrough works by uh, Luke Onyansky and Luke and, and himself about the construction of uh, um, uh, impulsive uh, interacting uh, spacetimes. And, and I want also to, to say that even in this L2, uh, the main L2 curvature uh, theorem that uh, we will hear about by Jeremy uh, in the next talk. Uh, there is also this issue of weak regularities that comes about in, uh, in the proof. Okay, and, and here I guess I put a footnote to, to tell you that, uh, but again, we have seen that in part in, in the lecture of uh, Da Fermos yesterday, uh, that there is a lot of uh, uh, work uh, in uh, uh, following the, uh, the work of Christodoulou, uh, especially by Da Fermos uh, himself and Komemi on uh, defining tame matter, so discussing the coupling with matter uh, in spherical symmetry and understanding uh, in, in which uh, regimes, in which cases uh, you, can, uh, you might be able to extend uh, the, the theorem of Christodoulou uh, to, to matter spacetimes, but, but this does not include compressible fluids. And also a result by Luke and O on, on a polynomial decay of, uh, of, uh, in, in these uh, spacetimes. Okay, so let me uh, give a brief outline of, uh, of this talk. So I will say some uh, elements of, uh, uh, about uh, weakly regular space-time with symmetries, uh, and then tell you about two or three results where we prove the existence of a foliation. So it's not you know, so much a, a result, but, but uh, to be able to prove the existence of these foliations uh, under weak regularity was only done uh, very uh, recently, in recent years. Uh, and I, I will talk about Gaudi symmetric matter spacetimes <coughs> and T2 symmetric vacuum spacetimes. 
And then I will go uh, to a little bit more technical uh, to tell you about uh, results, qualitative results <laughs> about these space times in a, in a plain uh, symmetric case, uh, in a T2 symmetric case, and in a Gaudi symmetric case. Uh, and under, uh, with various coupling, so in a, in a, with a scalar field or in a vacuum or the coupling with the matter, the compressible matter. So depending on the situation, the matter model that you put, no matter or some you know, scalar field or compressible fluid, uh, you have somehow, at least at this stage of the development of these uh, ideas, you have to impose certain uh, uh, stronger or weaker uh, symmetries in order to answer a certain uh, questions. So the strong censorship is, of course, what you, you, you would like to obtain in a more general situation. But here, this is something I'm discussing under very strong, uh, very, very strong uh, symmetry assumption, but with weak regularity. So it's interesting to have the possibility to handle these colliding space times. And also, uh, uh, you know, proving future geodesic completeness. So uh, uh, Jacques Moulivici presented this work uh, yesterday. So, so here I will just tell you about the definition of geodesics. It's, this was basically the, the piece that uh, uh, was, was missing in his uh, lecture, was, was not developed in his lecture yesterday. Uh, and, and the last uh, topic here is, uh, has to do with the area of the orbits uh, of symmetry and, and to analyze uh, asymptotic behavior of, uh, of this area. So, uh, so let me start with some words about uh, uh, this, uh, how to identify a framework to deal with weakly regular space times. And it turns out that to do that, you have to, uh, to really look carefully at the structure of the Einstein equations with uh, symmetry. And uh, so I want first to refer to a, a paper I, I wrote with Mardare a few years ago, where we look at the definition and stability of Lorentzian manifolds, uh, for which the metric is only in, uh, in uh, H1, uh, so that the curvature is still well defined, but it is well defined only as a distribution. And theoretically, uh, you should just keep in mind uh, this form here for the curvature, the Ricci curvature. Uh, you have some derivatives of the Christopher symbols and then some quadratic product of. Uh, of the gamma. And so the natural level of regularity that we will be working with is to assume that the gamma in L2 or the metric belongs to H1. Uh, and, and so if you, if you want to see more about, um, about a geometric, fully geometric definition, you can look at this paper with Mardare or some earlier work, which was uh, by Geroch and Trashen in uh, coordinates. So, so he was also discussing uh, the same level of regularity some, some uh, years back. Uh, now, if you construct your space time and you want to have a foliation, uh, the second fundamental form will be naturally in L2. And, and then you continue, and there are a number of uh, geometric objects that you want to define, again, in a weak sign. So you look at various uh, uh, quantities. And for instance, defining the lead derivative, uh, this is something, if you want to express the symmetry properties of your space time, this is something that you have to do, again, in a weak science. So I just put on the, on the screen here this formula where you understand that if you want to define the left-hand side, you define it by uh, considering the right-hand side, where two terms will be uh, smooth. It would typically be in L1 if H is in L1. But the first one uh, is only a distribution. So you define this object here as a distribution by uh, using uh, the, the right-hand side as a, as a defining uh, expression. Now, there is another, uh, another point which I want to make here, which we have uh, developed with, uh, with uh, Jacques Moulevici, uh, which is this idea that when you want to express the regularity of this uh, metric, uh, it's, uh, it's important to work with a non-smooth frame, which is uh, an orthogonal frame which is adapted to the symmetry, uh, to the killing fields that, uh, that you, you do. So, so the frame itself is, is not smooth. Now, uh, so if you, if you are able to define a concept of, uh, of weak solution, then you have to look at, uh, at the existence uh, and develop some, some existence theory for a system of nonlinear 
wave equations. And typically for the models I have in mind, this was done by Moncrief, Berger, Ringstrom, uh, assuming at least uh, <coughs> estimates on, uh, on two derivatives of the solutions. So this is something that we want to get rid of. And instead, we, we want to work at the level of some kind of natural energy uh, for, for the problem. And this energy will be at the level of uh, uh, one derivative of the metric. And in fact, when you, you look at, uh, you know, at the system, uh, the system with T2 symmetry, Gaudi symmetry, etc., and you, you especially you look at the coupling with the matter, you realize that there are not one natural energies, but there are typically two energies that you want to, to play with, one which more or less controls the geometry, and the other one which is uh, uh, suitable for, for the matter content of the space-time. <laughs> And then you, you continue by using and essentially the, the structures, the algebraic, algebraic structure of the Einstein equations. Again, I'm talking about a uh, problem with symmetries. Uh, so you have a system of, uh, of second order wave equation for the various metric coefficients. Uh, these coefficients are also constrained by certain differential uh, equations, second order, first order equations. Uh, and what is good is that behind that, as we have seen also in a couple of lectures, uh, there is a lot of structure and there is a wave map structure that you, uh, you can get, uh, at least under Gaudi symmetry. And, and then you do you know, various analysis where, again, you, you take all the properties that you can, you can see uh, uh, in, into account. Now, again, I'm interested in a vacuum case and in a, in a matter situation. Uh, if you look at, uh, at the vacuum case, uh, what is uh, one goal here is to be able to include impulsive gravitational waves. So the basic example which is behind that is an example of can penrose when you see uh, colliding space times and singularities propagating. So typically you have curvature singularities along null hypersurfaces. And I'm also interested in, in a situation of, uh, of uh, matter where the matter is a compressible fluid. And uh, what happens here is that if, even if you start with something smooth initially, uh, because of the nonlinear propagation in, a, in, a, in the Euler equations, you will see shocks that uh, arise that form in, a, in finite time. And so the series, uh, the framework, has to be able to handle these, uh, these uh, uh, So you have these continuities that uh, propagate at, uh, at a speed which is not a light speed. There is a speed of, uh, um, yeah, I guess that's precisely a misprint here. So there is a speed of sound which is uh, uh, associated with the fluid. And, and if you have the, these jumps in a, in a fluid, as a consequence, you will observe uh, also jump uh, curvature discontinuities propagating the space time uh, that will uh, sit on a, on a you know, speed of, uh, will be propagating as a speed of sound and not the speed of light. Okay, and so if you, if you uh, have these uh, this, uh, classes of singular space times with impulsive, uh, waves and shock waves, then you can start analyzing the, the global properties. Uh, the first step will be to, to try to go beyond just a local existent result, but analyze, uh, construct a global foliation. In, uh, in, uh, under T2 symmetry, there is a, a natural time function which is geometrically defined and given by the area of the orbits of symmetry. So this is a function, the time function that we will typically uh, use here. You can also use uh, CMC foliation, but, but typically that seems to be most convenient uh, under T2 symmetry. Uh, and, and then you have to, again, to revisit a number of, uh, of, uh, of results that uh, assume uh, high order uh, derivatives. And maybe a final point here is that uh, the geodesic completeness, which is one of the properties that you would like to obtain, uh, requires, b before you can even look at the problem, you have to check if uh, you can define a notion of geodesics for weekly regular space times with symmetry. And, and I, I will say a few words about that in a, in a few minutes. OK, so, so now I have two, two results, uh, one with Alan Rendal, and the next one will be with uh, Jacques Moulevici. 
uh, where we construct a global foliation for a certain class of space time. So in this situation, we, uh, what I do here, I, I look at the compressible fluids. So compressible fluids is, is given by, uh, so you have the Einstein equations. And uh, what you uh, assume is that the, the energy momentum tensor is described by, uh, by this uh, expression here. Uh, so where mu is, uh, is uh, the so-called mass energy density of the, of the fluid, u is a vector field, which is a time-like, future-oriented unit. Uh, and if you want to completely describe the matter content, you, you, you have also to prescribe uh, the expression for the pressure. So the pressure is a function of, uh, of, uh, of the mass energy density, which for instance can be taken to be a, a linear in terms of, uh, of mu, where k uh, is uh, precisely the speed of sound in, a, in this uh, problem. So the unknowns are the matrix, uh, mass energy density, and uh, the velocity. And uh, what we have uh, done with Alan Rendal was to assume Gaudi symmetry and uh, look, at, uh, look at the existence of such spacetime. So, so when we started this project, uh, there was no, I mean, nothing known about uh, uh, such uh, classes of spacetimes containing uh, fluids, except certain you know, simple examples, but, but certainly no such uh, uh, classes uh, with a global foliation. Of course, you can always, there are, of course, general results uh, where you don't assume symmetry and you, you solve for a small time and you have a local, a la Choke Brua, you have a local existence uh, uh, result and you can even define a maximal uh, uh, hyperbolic development for that. But, but this would not contain shocks at all. Right? So this is a different situation where I'm assuming that the initial data set is weakly regular and I, I get a space-time which contains shocks and impulsive waves. Uh, and, and, uh, and so I, I want to, in this connection, I, I want to, uh, to say that there is this uh, uh, breakthrough work by Christodoulou to prove that shocks form. So this is really something that you cannot avoid. And I can also mention a, a different work with, by Jared Speck and, and other people uh, where you actually prove the existence of smooth solutions, smooth spacetimes uh, for the Einstein-Euler equations, but uh, in a situation where you also include a, a positive cosmological constant in, in your problem. Otherwise, uh, shocks have to be included and, and treated. Uh, the Gaudi symmetry on T3, we have seen that yesterday, so we have two killing fields. And uh, so the main property is the fact that certain constants, called twist uh, constants, are vanishing. Uh, the fact that they are constants is a consequence of the Einstein equation and was observed by uh, Gerorge. And, and so they give you certain, uh, certain property of this, uh, of this sort, uh, which we are assuming here. Uh, and it, it does simplify the problem by removing uh, a, a good uh, a couple of equations to, to our big system. And let me uh, finish this slide by saying that this, this Gaudi symmetry is, is interesting to describe, physically to describe cosmologies and, and inhomogeneous cosmologies. So you have uh, some special dependence. And, and these solutions in space-time have typically a big bang in a, in a, in a, in a, uh, in a, in a, in a future, say, and a big crunch in the past. So, so there is this uh, structure that is well known uh, in the homogeneous case, but this class of space-time extends that to the inhomogeneous uh, situation. Now, um, now this Gaudi and more generally T2 symmetric space-time have been studied uh, by a number of people assuming uh, enough regularity. So I mentioned already Montcrieg, Berger, Ringstrom. Uh, now if you look at the coupling with the kinetic matter using the Vlasov equation, there are also a number of people who have been uh, looking at that. And maybe the final uh, paper is by Dafermos and, and Rendal. Uh, you can also add a cosmological constant, and, and there are all kinds of issues that uh, come about uh, under, under these, uh, uh, in these cases. Uh, and and so before we 
as I said before, I started uh, looking at uh, fluids with, uh, with John Stewart. So we had a kind of local existence result uh, b before uh, I, I worked with uh, Alan Rendal, but, but it did not produce a global foliation. So, uh, so the goal here is whether we can uh, treat weak solutions to that system and possibly say something about the role of the matter and see how the introducing the matter does actually uh, modify the uh, qualitative properties of the solutions. And uh, so before I can state the result of the existence of a global foliation, let me be a little bit more specific about the regularity. So the initial data set is prescribed by giving a three uh, a manifold, uh, I mean, it's actually just a metric G bar, uh, which, which has H1 regularity and a special uh, topology is T3. We have also a symmetric two tensor field K bar, which is in L2. So this is according to what uh, I mentioned earlier. Uh, but now if you want to describe the uh, content uh, of the space-time, the initial data set, you have to also prescribe the matter content, which is given by uh, scalar field rho bar, which I'm taking in L1. Uh, and this quantity is, uh, is measured by an observer, which moves uh, orthogonally to the foliation slices. And there is a second quantity, which is a vector field tangent, which will be tangent to the slice that you uh, the in the space-time you want to construct, and uh, this fluid momentum uh, quantity is also taken to be in L1. So, so you have four data to prescribe the initial data set. This data cannot be freely, uh, as we have seen also in some lectures, uh, freely specified. They have to satisfy certain Einstein constraints. And uh, right away you see that you have to be careful about uh, how this is, this is defined, because you have to understand some of these terms uh, in the sense of distribution. So, so typically, the right-hand side uh, here uh, belongs to some LP space. Uh, but the left-hand sides here are uh, distributions and are only defined in the weak sense. Uh, I also can mention that uh, from the constraints, you can deduce some additional, uh, but, but in fact, quite limited regularity uh, by the fact that uh, you know a little bit more regularity on the on the on the on the right hand side, which gives you some information about the left hand side, and finally we assume that these data are invariant under the Gaudi symmetries that uh, I mentioned before. Now, uh, now for the solution itself, you you do something similar. Now you look for a foliation by space-like hypersurfaces, and you impose on every slice uh, the same regularities that I discuss on the initial slice, right? So there is nothing uh, new here. G sub t, k sub t are uh, the induced uh, metric and the second fundamental form. They have to be in, the, in those spaces. And similarly, the density on, on the slice or the momentum vector on the slice uh, have to be in L1. And you are now ready to uh, use the definition I discussed before uh, of weak solutions to the Einstein-Euler equations. So this makes sense. The Einstein equation makes sense in a weak sense. So the curvature is only a distribution, the scalar curvature uh, also. And, uh, and you, you can check that this implies the Euler equations, which uh, will give me the evolution equations for the, for the matter content of the space time. And so this is a result I had uh, uh, with uh, Alan Rendal. Uh, if you give me Gaudi symmetric weakly regular uh, uh, initial data, uh, with constant area, so this is a technical restriction, but it's not really a, a major restriction for uh, the initial data set, because I really want to construct, I mean, this is a natural in, in terms of constructing uh, this aerial foliation. And the existence uh, here is telling you that there exists a space-time which is a, a Cauchy development of, uh, of this data. Uh, but more than that, you can cover that uh, remember that we are assuming symmetry, so we are really uh, we have a lot of properties that we would not have, of course, without the symmetry assumptions. So we can use a single coordinate chart and construct a global foliation, uh, which is based on, on a, as I said before, there is a time function which is globally defined, uh, which, which has a geometric meaning, and it is simply the area uh, of the two-dimensional orbits of, uh, of the T2 uh, symmetry isometry group. So I call it capital R, and I use this at the time, except that I have to distinguish two situations 
uh, say, contracting or uh, expanding situation. So in fact, the time will be uh, taken to be plus or minus the area. So this is what is convenient. It's not so usual. In a vacuum, you don't do that. But, but when you have the matter, compressible matter coupling, uh, because of the irreversibility, uh, this is a way that you have to look at your problem. So either you fix a, a T, you know, positive T, and, and you solve, uh, and you construct uh, expanding space times. And we can show that uh, this uh, area function grow uh, without bound uh, in the expanding direction. So things expand, and, and just uh, this area goes to infinity. Or there is a second situation of contracting space times. And here we take t to be negative, and we approach uh, the singularity. Uh, except that for this statement here, so with Alan Rendall, we, uh, what we proved was that uh, in the contracting case, starting with a, a, a negative time, the time grows and, and our construction stop. So C1, so C1 is, is, a, is, a, is a maximal uh, area, uh, t time that you can reach uh, by uh, doing this, uh, our construction, right? So our development has, has a property that there is a C1, and we don't know at this level whether C1 is zero or not. Right? So whether we, we contract this area to zero or to maybe a finite value. So, so you may look at this result by, by saying it's a first step, at least, toward proving the nonlinear stability of Gaudi spacetimes when the compressible matter is included. So Gaudi spacetimes are exactly the same description as that uh, without the matter. So you put the matter and you have uh, some, uh, some stability uh, in the sense that you find spacetimes that uh, have similar properties, at least to you know, the extent of, uh, of deriving, of constructing a global foliation with similar properties as in the vacuum case. Uh, okay, so I have here maybe a slice about uh, uh, the construction of coordinates. So that's one issue that you have to, to look at first. So you have these killing fields, and uh, uh, I just wrote uh, the expression of uh, some expression of, uh, of the area. So it's connected with the, uh, the killing fields. Uh, so the fact that this area is constant on each orbit uh, allows you to, to start construction. And one, uh, one first issue that, that comes is the regularity of, uh, of this function. Because you want to use it to foliate your space time. So, so checking the regularity of it is, seems to be the first step. Uh, and it turns out that uh, by using the, the Einstein constraint equations, we can prove, it was not assumed, but, but it follows, uh, as I said already, from the Einstein constraint that the gradient of r is actually uh, in, uh, in w11. And, uh, and this is a reason why we can repeat a construction that goes back to uh, uh, Gerard Gaudi and, and Crutchiel has had done a, a lot uh, about the discussion of general uh, T2 and Gaudi symmetric space times. And so we can prove we can prove that uh, if we assume that it is non-flat and, and even in a weakly regular situation, uh, we can prove that the gradient is time-like. And, uh, and this uh, motivates uh, the use of the function r as a time function. And we can also show that uh, there are two cases. Either the space-time is expanding or contracting. And as I explained before, uh, the kind of normalization that we do here in choosing the time uh, is not quite the same uh, because of the irreversibility. Uh, okay, and so now I'm in a position to tell you uh, what uh, I want to do next. Uh, so, so, of course, you, you would like to say much more about the space-time, not just the existence of a foliation. So, so what can be said about the, the future boundary of, uh, of the maximal Cauchy development? So one important issue is whether uh, uh, we can find a global foliation with C1, this is uh, maximal time, uh, to be zero. But in fact, uh, so in, in the vacuum, it, it is true. In the vacuum, this C1 is right? So you just construct and you go to the uh, zero area uh, in the future. But this is not true for Euler, uh, Einstein Euler spacetimes. And there are explicit, uh, especially homogeneous spacetimes, which have C1 uh, to be non-zero, uh, uh, and this is a situation where you, you get this uh, weak uh, null singularity. You have a blow-up of the curvature. <coughs> so, uh, 
So, so this is an issue that you, you would not see in a vacuum, right? So there is a, a difference uh, in, a, in a vacuum. And, and, and this was not solved in my work with Alan Rendall, but recently I, I was able to solve that and to uh, answer this question. And I, I will show you the statement in a few minutes. Uh, the second topic is to derive time asymptotics under weak regularity and prove geodesic completeness. So essentially, uh, uh, Jacques Mulevici discussed uh, the main part of our work uh, uh, yesterday in this direction. And I, I would just today say a few more words about the uh, definition of geodesics. Uh, and, and another uh, topic is proving the strong cosmic censorship. Uh, so this is a, this is a very uh, uh, difficult uh, problem which has been solved uh, by Ringstrom for smooth space times uh, under, um, for the general Gaudi uh, class. Uh, and and I uh, revisited uh, a proof not of Ringstrom but the one of Moncrief uh, in, in a much uh, smaller class of space times of polarized Gaudi space times. And uh, with John Stewart, I, I was also uh, able to, to prove uh, this uh, uh, censorship conjecture uh, for weekly regular space times. But again, uh, as I mentioned before, under a very strong assumption, so polarized Gaudi is really the, the strongest, uh, yet non trivial, but it's really the strongest uh, symmetry assumption you can make uh, and, and still be able to address uh, these questions. So I, I will talk about it in, uh, now. And so uh, I guess, right, I guess maybe this was four or five. Okay, the numbers may not be quite right. Uh, so now let me uh, mention also the results uh, I have with uh, Smule VC, so global developments of weakly regular T2 symmetry space times. So now we follow uh, what I was doing with uh, Alan Rendall, but now it's a, in a vacuum case and uh, only T2 symmetry instead of Gaudi symmetry, but the statement is, is, uh, is similar uh, in a sense that we uh, prescribe initial data set with weak regularity uh, and we have a, a constant area for this uh, initial slice. Uh, this uh, initial data set has T2 symmetry and we prove the existence of, uh, of uh, development of this data. Uh, which is maximal among all such developments. And in this case, because, because we are in a vacuum, uh, we can rely on, uh, for instance, on the Eisenberg uh, Weaver uh, result, uh, which we extend in a non smooth case to show that uh, this, um, uh, the area uh, is actually going up to zero here. So, so the area function, the time function, uh, describe the whole interval from zero to plus infinity in this vacuum case, even in the T2 case. So we had to revisit uh, uh, all, the, all the arguments uh, of uh, uh, Berger and, and other people, Kuchiel, Eisenberg, Moncrief, uh, again, because they were using uh, C3 uh, second and third order derivatives. Okay, uh, so I see that the time is, uh, is going uh, fast. So this system of equation, you have seen it uh, I think yesterday with uh, uh, Jacques. Uh, so, uh, so maybe let me just quickly say we have this uh, metric. We have one, two, three, four, five, six uh, metric coefficients to determine the metric. We use uh, this area coordinates in, uh, in, uh, in the work, or we use conformal coordinates. So we have to combine uh, both. And this is a form of the system that uh, you can see just quickly. And there is more, two constraints, two. Uh, ODs for, uh, for the twist uh, uh, quantities, uh, et cetera. OK, so, uh, so now I, I hope I have time now to uh, state three more qualitative results where I'm saying something <coughs> more specific about the space times, not just the construction of foliations, but some uh, specific properties. Uh, and the first result with John Stewart concern plane symmetric space times, so polarized Gaudi. Uh, and the coupling with an irretentional null fluid, uh, which we can reduce to, uh, in fact, to a scalar field. So we describe the velocity field uh, via uh, potential. We call it psi. And, and so this is, uh, this is, if you like, that's the situation I was looking with Alan Rendall, uh, but in a, in a much uh, uh, in, in a simpler situation, a really much simpler situation of polarized Gaudi and, uh, and the fluid 
uh, is, is also more or less a scalar field. So it's not really a compressible fluid. So it, it's not going to produce shocks. So what we saw here is a case of colliding space-time problem inspired by um, the example of Kant Penrose. So we give two intersecting null hypersurfaces intersecting along a space-like two-plane. And we, um, we solve the characteristic initial value problem by prescribing the initial, the incoming radiation, so weakly irregular initial data for the geometry and the scalar field on these two hypersurfaces. And also, there are some data that you have to prescribe on the two plane. And we don't assume any kind of compatibility condition. We are really working with weak regularity, so compatibility condition would not be uh, natural to be imposed. And the main result is the existence of a weakly regular future Cauchy development of, uh, of this data. And to get, uh, again, under a very strong uh, symmetry uh, assumption, uh, to prove that uh, on the future boundaries, the curvature will blow up generically, so not for all initial data, but for, in a sense, generic initial data. And remember that the curvature is defined in this class as a distribution. Right? So it's already not so well defined. So what does that mean to be, you know, to blow up? So, so we prove that uh, it's really ill-defined even as a distribution. So this tells us that uh, there is an inextendability of this, uh, of this development. And, and the statement that we are producing is a statement in, within uh, this weakly regular uh, class. So, so the interest of, of such a result, despite the fact that, uh, again, symmetry assumptions have been have been made uh, is, is that we have a setup where we, we can show that uh, space time with uh, singular curvature do exist. A and the level of regularity we have here is that the Ricci uh, curvature is in L1, may contain jump discontinuities along null hypersurfaces, and the veil part uh, is uh, only a distribution, which is a derivative of an L2 function. And, and you may have uh, measures that uh, are along null hypersurfaces. So this is essentially uh, just a slightly more formal statement to what I, I just said. Uh, so we, we show the existence of such a space-time. And we prove that the curvature blows up to infinity in the h uh, minus norm and no longer makes sense. So even as a distribution in this space, as one approach the future boundary, uh, which, so which is defined according to some uh, null coordinates that, uh, that we have to use to, 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 to solve the initial value problem. This is uh, how you, you, you handle that by introducing uh, null coordinates. Uh, and to, uh, so, so we prove the inextendability of, uh, of this space time. Uh, and, uh, and I want to mention that uh, so after we presented this result with uh, John Stewart, so a few months uh, later, I was, I was amazed to, to see that uh, uh, Jonathan Luke and Igor Nijansky were actually able to prove uh, a result of existence in the same spirit, but much more technically uh, challenging. Uh, so they were able to analyze the nonlinear interaction of impulsive gravitational waves. So this is a problem I'm, I'm discussing here with plane symmetry. Uh, and and uh, so they had a couple of papers on this uh, topic. And there is now the work that we have heard yesterday by uh, Mihaly that goes to uh, far, far uh, more than that even. OK, uh, so uh, still I have some uh, time to tell you uh, two things. Uh, so how to define geodesics uh, in uh, weekly regular space time. So this is joint with uh, Jacques Moulevici. Uh, so the objective here is really to prove the future geodesic completeness in the expanding direction. But a tool within uh, this uh, construction, this proof, was to be able to define the geodesics. So I wrote here the expression of the metric. And I show you uh, the discussion in the case of, uh, of uh, Gaudi symmetry. But it doesn't really matter. For T2 symmetry, uh, the same uh, can be done. And, and so the problem goes like this. We have a, a geodesic equation that uh, we would like to, uh, to define. Uh, so I, I wrote the equation here. And the point is that 
in the frame, so there is a frame that we define adapted to the symmetry, which is not smooth, and each we, in which the Christopher coefficients are essentially L2 functions or LP functions on space-like hypersurfaces. So this is a regularity that, uh, that we have to work with. And this regularity is too low in principle for the geodesic equation to be well defined, right? But we are not at a level where uh, you could just uh, have a, call a, a standard theorem for the existence. And so what we did here is to, uh, to combine the regularities that we, some additional regularities that uh, we, we are able to, to derive about these Christopher symbols and also to strongly use the symmetry properties that we have. Right? So you have seen a, a little bit of that already in a, uh, in a, in a lecture of uh, Jacques yesterday, but, uh, but so it goes like this. So we have this result of existence of geodesics uh, saying that if you prescribe uh, time-like vector xi1 and, uh, and some uh, initial point in a manifold. You want to solve your geodesic equation from this uh, data. So the first observation that we make is that there is an additional regularity, uh, which is this one, that if you take the Christopher symbols and you look at, uh, at their trace, so you, you, the value, if you, if you wish, along uniformly time-like curves. So you can show that this quantity, first of all, is well-defined, which is not clear from the regularity I mentioned earlier, uh, and it belongs to L1. So it's well-defined as an L1 function along the curve. Uh, and this is true for any uniformly time-like curve. So there is an issue in what we do of making sure that we control carefully uh, certain constants, and, and the fact that the curve is time-like is essential uh, and so we have to, uh, to, to discuss that in our, in our proof. And, uh, and so we prove, uh, using strongly these uh, this, uh, properties that the geodesic equation admits uh, one solution, at least, uh, where uh, xi dot is uh, only w11. So this is a level of regularity that, uh, that we are able to cover here. Uh, and in particular, if you use this result, you can define a, a maximal geodesic uh, on, on a maximal time in interval. So the proof goes by, uh, again, by discussing certain uniform time-like bounds in weakly regular space times, uh, establishing this L1 regularity of the Christopher symbols and how they vary depending on the, on the curve, on the time-like curve that you, you, are, you are working with. Uh, and then there is this step of uh, some kind of reduction of, uh, of the system of uh, geodesic equations uh, to one nonlinear ODE with uh, algebraic, three algebraic constraints. And this gives us the idea of defining a sort of a geodesic map on which you want to do iterations. Right? So all of that is, is a, a little bit technical. Uh, I put some of that uh, in the slides, but uh, so, so we defined, uh, you know, to be uniformly time-like and be expressed in this way. Uh, and we, we express more, more precisely what it means in, uh, in our foliation. Uh, and we also, uh, because of this uh, construction, the fact that we want to uh, mod out the, the, uh, the symmetries, uh, we also have to work with projection of time-like curves, so we somehow extend uh, this uh, notion of uniformly time-like to uh, uh, the flat uh, caution uh, metric. And, uh, <coughs> and then we work out certain regularity. So U and A were coefficients, metric coefficients in, in, our, uh, in our aerial coordinates. And uh, so we can prove So we can prove that these quantities admit traces, and these traces can be well defined as H1 functions along any uniformly time-like curve. <coughs> and this allows us to uh, analyze uh, Christopher symbols. Uh, we have also another regularity for uh, another metric coefficient, and again, analyze certain components of uh, the Christopher symbols uh, to also uh, admit uh, traces. And so to do that, we rely strongly on our earlier uh, work on proving uh, the existence of, uh, of the space times. And for instance, the fact that there are wave equal one plus one wave equations behind is, of course, very strongly uh, used. We have a second result where uh, we look at <coughs> how these uh, uh, quantities, these critical symbols, 
uh, will depend on, uh, on the interval of definition, uh, the length of the interval, or will depend on, uh, on the curve that, uh, that we are looking at. And, and the story is the same. We, again, use strongly the structure of the equation, uh, and we do some, uh, yeah, some integration of, uh, of the equation that, uh, that we have here. Uh, and this leads us to uh, define this uh, mapping I was talking about. So the map is based on uh, these uh, invariants. <coughs> so you have the geodesic equation. Uh, you have these uh, quantities which, has con which are conserved. And, and uh, so these conserved quantities will help us to reformulate uh, the geodesic equation uh, by, in a, in a way, concentrating on one, in some sense, one component of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the path of, uh, of the geodesic. Uh, and, and the end of, uh, so there is a, a mapping that we define in this way, and, and eventually we have uh, uh, some certain equicontinuity argument or stability, and, and the stability property I mentioned before uh, is, is used <coughs> here to do the, to do the estimate. So I'm supposed to stop soon, but uh, I probably have a few minutes, still a few minutes, to <coughs> tell you about the last, uh, the final topic. Uh, and so this is a, the place where I'm, I'm sorry, I, I drink water, but uh, <coughs> uh, OK. So this is a joint with uh, Natasia Grubik, and it's also uh, covered in a, in a, in a big paper I'm writing now on a T2 symmetry Einstein Euler. Uh, and we want to analyze the future boundary of Gaudi symmetric Einstein Euler spacetimes and say something about this constant C1 that I mentioned before. Right? So now I would like to show that this area uh, is going to 0. And we will uh, do that here by deriving certain new bounds, uh, which allows us to complete the analysis uh, I had with Rendal. Uh, and uh, so the goal, again, is to prove that the area of the group orbits is going to zero in uh, towards the future uh, for uh, contracting spacetimes. And But this is, as I said before, this is not true in general. For uh, general data, this is not the case. We can find counterexamples. So the result will be that uh, there is a kind of geometric invariant, which we can define, associated with the Gaudi symmetry. And provided it is initially non-vanishing, which is a generic uh, assumption, uh, then we, we prove this uh, result. Okay? And our condition is also, so we don't know for general solution what it really means, but, but, uh, but it is optimal. What we produce, this condition is optimal uh, within the class of specially homogeneous spacetimes. So, so this was motivated by mainly by so a number of papers that we, we are inspired uh, from. Uh, but the main paper is a, is a paper by Eisenberg and Weaver in a T2 symmetric vacuum case. Uh, so they show that uh, they show this property, and they show this property by uh, exhibiting an energy uh, which vanishes uh, precisely for uh, uh, only for certain exceptional solutions. So the solutions that do not produce this property, which are flat Kastner spacetimes. Uh, are characterized by the fact that certain uh, natural energy uh, is, is non-vanishing or is vanishing. Okay? And in fact, this is a, this idea that we first try to extend. And, and it, it didn't work. Uh, and so instead, we, uh, we uh, were inspired by this work by Ringstrom, which analyzed a completely different problem in a different direction. Uh, but we were inspired by, by him because he, he use a lot of this uh, wave map structure, and, and this geometric invariant is, is used for a different reason in, uh, in his work. So this is a, the result uh, here saying that if you consider Gaudi symmetric weakly regular Einstein Euler spacetime uh, with a constant area uh, e expanding, um, I guess it should be contracting, right? We are talking about t going to 0, sorry. Uh, so the first part is the existence I had with Alan Rendal. And so the new conclusion <coughs> is, that, uh, is, is that there is a certain uh, invariant uh, which, provided it is non-vanishing, uh, leads you uh, a definition that goes to uh, t1 e equals 0 and the area approach 0 in the future. So I have not yet tell you about 
uh, this uh, geometrically defined invariant. So that's what I, I would like to tell you. Before I can show you that, I show you the equations quickly. So you have uh, Einstein evolution equations. You have these equations for uh, the metric coefficients. You have two equations for the, uh, the fluid. Uh, there is, of course, a coupling through various uh, quantities. Uh, you have some source terms for the Euler equations. You have three Einstein constraint equations given by that. Uh, so I'm not discussing here uh, in detail this uh, structure. Uh, but I can at least show you uh, two energies. So I said before that there are two energies typically you have to work with. So one is given by uh, quantities that are squared of uh, metric coefficients. And the second energy contains this part, but contains, in addition, uh, a fluid contribution with, uh, uh, with the uh, mass energy density. And both energies turn out to, to be controllable. There are some controls that you can produce, you can derive uh, from here. And in particular, this is a way to justify the regularities that I've been talking about from the beginning. Right? You see this regularity uh, out of these uh, energies. Uh, and, uh, and so I. I uh, so somehow we were misled by uh, this first result where we analyzed specially homogeneous einstein euler spacetimes in the sense that this energy E1 give us uh, what we, you know, we want. I mean, E1 non-zero, uh, then we can, we can go up to time going to zero, area going to zero, and E1 non equals zero, then there are some additional subcases, but at least uh, there is one of these subcases where uh, we cannot, uh, we don't have the area going to zero. Okay, so so we could say, you know, maybe this is, would be a good assumption to look at the general case. If this energy is non-zero, everything should be fine, uh, etc. But but this is uh, uh, we cannot really prove it's not the case. But at least it, it doesn't seem from the analysis that this is a reasonable uh, idea. And so instead, we work with these uh, invariants. Uh, from Ringstrom based on the wave map structure. So I, I wrote three quantities here. <laughs> if you integrate these quantities uh, over uh, S1, you get quantities that are conserved even uh, with the matter content. And, uh, and in, part, in particular, this quantity D, uh, so this is a quantity, this is a geometric invariant, A squared plus BC that uh, uh, I'm talking about. And this quantity, so the, the catching point is that this quantity is actually equal to the energy, but only uh, for specially homogeneous uh, solutions, right? So somehow uh, the confusion, in, in, a, in a way, uh, came from, uh, from this property. Uh, but you should not uh, use this E1 in general. You should use this quantity D to, to decide about this uh, blow up or not. Uh, and, and so that's what we have done here. We use translation, del dilation, inversions, reflections that we have based on this uh, hyperbolic uh, structure. Uh, and that allows us to fix A, B, C to be certain quantities. And, and this is how we do the analysis. And I guess uh, so. this is one estimate we get from fluid, and another estimate for the geometry. Uh, and this is probably a good, uh, good time and a good place to stop. Thank you. <coughs>